Welcome back to Deep Thoughts on this beautiful summer day. It is 80 plus degrees out. And let me just tell you folks, it has been a long time since we've had any local warming. It's so funny and we're so fortunate they picked this time of the century to try and convince people that global warming was real. Right before the mini ice age. What a bunch of dumb fucks, I swear to Christ. But today we're going to talk about some other things. We're going to talk about... NASA coming clean because it's an extremely interesting topic. We want them to come clean. Uh, a lot of us thinks that think that people need to be put in jail for lying their entire lives. Some of us might agree on some immunity for those that have been forced by other uh, agencies, other alphabet agencies, where their life has been threatened, their children have been threatened, their pensions have been threatened, etc., etc., I mean, we look the other way when financial informants who have destroyed, you know, hundreds of thousands of lives by stealing pensions, stealing 401ks, we look the other way when they, uh, they go scot-free. So I think we owe it to at least the astronauts. You know, if we found out that an astronaut was participating in the hoax and really uh, submitting their minds... Uh, their, sorry, their knowledge base in order to further the hoax, then perhaps their immunity is uh, limited in some fashion. But for those that were just either like a Gus Grissom that was trying to blow the whistle or someone who was like uh, Neil Armstrong, who was very religious, didn't want to go meet his creator, having lied the entire time. Maybe there's full immunity for those folks, but think about it. Let's say you work at a convenience store and there is an item that was uh, right by the counter right by the front door and it was there and you turned around and you kind of heard someone come in you thought they were going to stay and you turned around and the item's gone it's not a mystery they just grabbed it you were looking the wrong way you shouldn't have put it on the counter whatever some random stranger took it doesn't really matter you want to you want to catch them and you want to prosecute them because they took your item now if you worked at a target and you were deep inside the store on the back wall and you work in electronics and you turn around and there's that 70 inch television you've been trying to pawn off for the last year you turn around to help someone 60 seconds later turn back and the tv's gone then you have a mystery on your hand you have a david copperfield moment you're like how in the hell even if two guys came in to grab it how could they have grabbed it so quickly now you got a mystery on your hands you want to find the criminals that took the tv but you want to find out how the hell they did it so you can put interrupters in there to make sure that it can't be done easily again. That day in uh, September of 2001, we kind of know the end result of what happened. The, you know, the towers came down, a bunch of other stuff happened. It uh, greenlit a war in the Middle East. It erased the Constitution of the United States. We got to see who was a deep stater and who was a true patriot. Anyone for touching the Constitution is not a patriot. Those who stood next to it and tried to blow the whistle, well, they're the true patriot. But we need to figure out how they did what they did. How did they wire these buildings to, to be imploded? Basic physics will tell anybody the pancake theory is ridiculous. As one floor hits another floor, there is a split-second insert of time as the resistance of the previous floor pushes back and 100. 10 floors, you're going to have more and more and more uh, resistance with two impact floors that are literally built to resist the previous floors above it. So the building was designed not to collapse, period. It was. Two and a half inch glass will never, in the history of man, glass resist two 28,000 pound titanium Rolls Royce engines. But that's what happened on that day. And those engines supposedly bounced off the glass and then just weren't present. Only one teeny tiny engine, so small that a group of men could carry it out like a casket to get rid of the evidence. Very important. It's all bullshit. The moon missions are bullshit. All these rovers everywhere are bullshit. But in this episode, what we're going to do is try to analyze the logistics the PR, the technology, the, the political implications, the pride implications around the world of NASA coming clean. 
I mean, seriously, we are sitting here in a, as a community online, and our goal is to pound a 10-inch, 10 10-penny 10 nail, excuse me, right into the eyeball of all these NASA people, right? That's sort of the analogy of us complaining and complaining and complaining. And I had a really good friend of mine. I told this story a long time ago when I was in the software industry. Um, we had a newcomer. I, I was one of the founding, uh, you know, I'm not... Uh, the LLC founding member, but I was the first uh, in the first 20 employees. And in terms of development, there was only like five people helping the founder develop. And I was like the sixth somewhere in there. But I had been there for two years. I had, you know, contributed a, a gigantic portion of the DNA. I mean, in terms of the guy that broke, programmed the product, the next person down that contributed unique DNA, I would say I was either second or third. I set this up for a very specific reason because two years later we wanted to port it to the Windows platform. We'd already ported it uh, before this guy came in, but the code was not that great, and this guy was an expert. So he's going to come in and speed up our Windows version of the product. And he had a huge pile of problems he had to fix, and he did fix them. He was amazing. But he heard me complaining about the product in general, this is irrespective of his participation. It wouldn't have anything to do with his performance. But he got angry and he thought I was just some punk-ass kid. Some young, like, support guy or something complaining about the product. And so he put out this this word to my boss. I can't stand this kid. All he does is complain. And my boss started laughing because he's like, man, you have no idea who you're talking about. He's like, this kid made a gigantic part of the product. He is there to help you. Um, he does submit the fix strategies but he's un unaware about how to do what you do so he's excited about you being here and so finally I go into his cube and he goes man I thought you were just a pain in the ass and he goes I didn't realize you were you know one of us you look so young it doesn't seem like that's possible and so he and I made real good friends but this is what we're doing we, instead of complaining about this I made an episode about replacing NASA that's a little bit different tense that is as if some magical wand fix the fucking problem that we have, and then we move on to create another agency. And I will remind listeners that within the month, month and a half at max, of me saying replacing NASA, Donald Trump came out with Space Force. Talk about manifest destiny, man. So how do you logistically break down such a massive uh, conquest? Well, I think that the first question is, we have to figure out what NASA means and what, what it means to the world, what it means to the United States of America, what it means financially in terms of just economic health within the world, and what it means to us as a public relations organization. Do we have clandestine space projects that it's maintaining that are below the skin? It's a multi-pronged, multi-layered endeavor. So if we wanted to come clean, we have to come clean on a level that all those that are the highest level of adversaries against NASA are satiated that they have seen what they need to see, that reparations have been paid, uh, at least morally, maybe some of it financially, all the way down to the person that it believes up to that point of coming clean, that we did go to the moon, that we have rovers on Mars, etc., etc., then we have this sort of world history problem because we will have admitted that the United States of America absolutely did not go to the moon. And, and that is just so massive at this point in history. Now imagine just fast forward 500 years and the kids are sitting there going, you know, I mean, there's going to be, there is going to be some sort of catchphrase invented for the United States of America, similar to the catchphrase that was pasted onto the, um, Native Americans. Native Americans were accused of two things that never, uh, that weren't their ideas initially. One was scalping human beings. The white man scalped the Native Americans. How do we know that? Well, white men are typically bald, and there's nothing to grab a hold of. But you can grab a hold of a beautiful mane of a Native American and be a total jerk, right, and scalp them. So they ended up returning the favor. The other one was that when we showed up supposedly in the 1500s, we didn't bring what we needed to be here because we just didn't know the environment. They loaned us blankets. They loaned us uh, all the supplies, strategic resources to survive. 
And then eventually they wanted it back, and then we called them Indian givers. All right, there's going to be a phrase like that for the United States of America. Now what's beautiful is we now have probably lured in China, we've lured in Israel, uh, Russia has its own fibs, and so maybe through a distributed, a distributed um, coming clean strategy, or maybe we come clean in such a technique, in such a way that's so clear and so easy, that all the other countries are immediately caught because the same instrumentalities are used against them. And then there's not a lot of name calling, but who gives a shit? If I lied to you every episode of Deep Thoughts, then I deserve whatever name calling I, I earn from the public, right? Which is why I choose not to do that. So geez, which area do we go for first? I think the very first thing I would an- analyze is the economic impact of pulling $22 billion out of the however many thousand employees are inside the NASA apparatus. Obviously the very best strategy, <laughs> that's like a worse way to say that, obviously the best strategy, qualify, qualifier, is to simply repurpose the objective and come clean in a way that is, if you come clean, you become this Aesop fable, don't you? You become the boy that calls wolf. So you would have to absolutely liquidate everyone at the top and and technically speaking prove to the public that they simply inherited this project from the 60s and 70s with all these lies in place forced to carry the lies forward so we don't necessarily need to scarlet letter these individuals out of um, working ever again but we perhaps would not invite them to work in the space agency And they would always be a little bit marked that they were capable of holding a lie every single day. I know some of you will want to put everybody in jail. It would just get extremely messy at that point. And, you know, if you think that these people should go to jail right away, I would simply say you may lack the empathy or the capability to put yourself in a situation where you are trapped into the lie. And I'll give you an example that I give people, and no one thinks this thing through. The example I'm about to give you, I have never heard ever repeated on YouTube. I think this is an original epiphany of this show, which is, it has to do with a satanic sort of eyes wide shut rituals that occur out there. So you're this good guy. You're this good girl. Good lady, whatever, woman. And you show up to this party. Your friends invited you. Unbeknownst to you, it is an eyes wide shut party that you keep going deeper and deeper in this mansion. You go downstairs, downstairs, and you find yourself in a fucking weird ass dungeon room. And it's intriguing. It's it's history. You're looking at the room going, wow, someone actually built this like dungeon down here. It's just like, wow, what was this used for? And you're just asking questions. And then uh, a bunch of people come in, they give you this mask and they give you a robe and you're like, oh, wow, what's this? Uh, this is kind of like, you know, uh, eyes wide shut. But unbeknownst to you, a child's brought into the room and they're put on an altar. The kid is not happy. The kid is screaming. The kid is crying. Then this crazy bastard comes up and starts, you know, singing this Yale University skull and bones druid bullshit. Fucking stabs this kid. It's probably John Podesta or his brother Tony or both of them. And they're just killing this kid. Blood's coming out of the kid. It's going down some crazy sculpture, and it's falling into four goblets. And the four goblets are then brought up into the crowd, which is a nice circle around this ritual, and it starts going in some clockwise fashion. Until everyone in this room is given the opportunity to partake of the blood of this poor kid. And you were down there. And let's just say you're not going to completely shit yourself when this happens. Here comes the goblet up to your mouth. I mean, it's being given to you. Let's put it that way. And they're like, go ahead, drink. You've seen everybody doing this, and we make sure you're one of the last in the rotation so that you've got 10 examples or 15 examples before you see it done. Four times 15 or whatever, or five or whatever, however big this room is. And you now have this moment, a big grown-up moment. You know that if you go, if you were to scream and run out of that room, You're dead. Maybe you have a wife or a husband. You got two kids 
Maybe you have kids old enough that they have kids. And you're in this goddamn basement because you needed to star fuck somebody. You needed to be with rich people. And now you have this goblet in front of you. And if you don't drink it, you're dead. And you don't know how far it's going to go. If you don't drink it, did they kill your whole family? Obviously, this would be some palatious place where you've got Rothschild money. And so your big heroic arc of I'm going to tell them, you know, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me, it ain't going to happen. Because you have surrendered yourself through your own ego into this paradigm of, of money worship or status worship or class structure worship instead of just being a human being. Well, that's the problem with these individuals, like the astronauts, like the people that inherit these organizations. I mean, just think about it. 1972 was the last time we claimed to have gone to the moon. What if the person was, there was a human being in the United States of America that was born in 1972? Well, now they'd be about 48 years old. All right, 47, 48. They take over NASA. They, you know, they, they study really hard. They get the economics, the aerospace technology in their brain. They do really well. And they take over NASA, and this ritual happens to them. Not necessarily the blood ritual, but this idea they get pulled into a boardroom, and it's like, we are going to now tell you information. And after this point, this, this chronological line in the sand, after this point, if you resist us, we're going to fucking kill you and your family. So are you, uh, you on board? You're fucked. You're already on the other side of this membrane that you can't come back from. I give you that example so you guys can all calm down with this, you know, and maybe I've even violated my own code here, but I do believe that there are issues that we would have to deal with in the immunity process of carrying something that you inherit forward. Now, if you had an opportunity to clear the air and, and do this sort of thing and you chose to stay inside the darkness, that's a little bit different. But I don't think that that's something that happens in the NASA organization. Space exploration is important if we are really inside of a heliocentric model of the universe. With the Milky Way and stars and all that good stuff, planets out there in our solar system, a bunch of galaxies out there, potentially other members of other planets out there. We don't want to throw away every single person who has no idea that this is not a scam. Or this is a scam, right? We want to keep that mind share. But simply dividing up and trying to figure out, okay, if you're over this level of management, then you've had to have participated in the hoax. Hopefully it's so compartmentalized. And hopefully there's enough real research and real stuff being launched into space albeit maybe for an alphabet agency or the government or the military or something like that, that we can keep these people and not worry about them and their integrity. Hopefully it's just this thin layer at the top. Historically, that has always been the case. So financially, someone is going to have to figure out two things. What are we doing in NASA that is legit? And you and I can't answer that question. We don't know. Obviously, Mars missions, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't give a shit about Mars. Once the moon is figured out, I can start giving a shit about Mars. Right now, I would pull the plug on every single thing up there. Just pull the plug. If there really are rovers, I still wouldn't talk to them. Just pull the plug on them. There's nothing going on up there of any value. The moon is, is probably difficult to rationalize spending money on. But it's the nearest object we have in space. And again, for those of you who believe Project Blue Beam and all that stuff, okay, fine. We prove it doesn't exist. It's just a projection. <laughs> da, 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 da. Fine. You're going to get your way too, so don't even worry about it. I'm not going to go down that path on this particular episode. So, just as an as, as initial step, I would create you know, a model over here, which is the styrofoam model of what NASA is today. That's a metaphor for those of you trying to get too literal on this. And on the right side, I would create a new agency, perhaps Space Force, perhaps something else independent, but Space Force is fine with me. And we're going to have to figure out, uh, diagram all the compartments over here, this, this top-down mastaba of NASA. For any compartment in the NASA realm that is clean and, and without deception, you can immediately be picked up and put over into Space Force. 
as well as the bottom line budget, the business unit budget, the P&L moves over as well. And we're going to do that. We're going to carry things over. Now, there's going to be probably compartments that are have a minor level of of treason and sedition in them, right? And so we're going to have to have almost like a uh, you know a radiation bathing area in the middle where we bring it to the center and we disassemble it and we look at it and we go, okay, well this is actually a fairly legit compartment, but there's a P and L thing here where we uh, we routinely buy toilet seats for twenty thousand dollars a pop. So this needs to come off, and we need to acknowledge that to the public that this particular uh, agency was, you know, being victimized into some black op thing. But we need to comfortably write down and be able to explain to the public everyone within this compartment had no idea that this was being added to their P&L. So as we clean it off, they become clean, and we move them over to Space Force. Now, it's going to be hard to speculate some of this because we don't know. After this sifting occurs, there's going to be a pile of, of compartments, departments, and money, P&L, budgets. They're going to be completely sludgy, black, you know, Prometheus ooze that it's going to be either impossible to clean up. And then we have the individuals that participate in that financial sludge, in that scientific hoax sludge. And so that's going to be the toughest toxic dump to clean up. Perhaps then that is all lined up for the, the PR blitz that we'll have to do to the public to say, okay, these organizations were pure deep state. We're going to blame it on the alphabet agencies. We're going to grab a bunch of people who are totally uh, guilty of other things. They would have, they would have, you know, they would have um, served life sentences and perhaps killed Gitmo for other things, and we're just going to put it on their backs. Now, if we just have black op projects, and there's a distinction here, that's one of the things that has to come clean in the United States of America is simply to say we have black budget projects. We do. Hey, public, we got black budget projects. What are those? Well, those are technology. Um, tracks within the within the country that that build things like the U2, the SR71, the Aurora, that weird space shuttle that goes up that doesn't have any passengers in it. We're doing these things so that we can build mechanisms to interrupt World War 3 to figure out uh, you know if we were ever to come clean that Roswell was real and that we actually do have alien neighbors then I think that would open up a tremendous budget and what's really stupid, I mean, it just depends. I mean, again, I went in to disprove Roswell and came out a complete believer. Believe me, that ain't easy for me. If the government would simply say, we have made contact with aliens on these occasions, we have had them in captivity on these occasions, here are the photographs of them, there would be no problem funding black ops shit forever. In fact, it wouldn't, wouldn't probably have to be black. But they hoard technology because we have a petrodollar system. And so if we were able to figure out, like I always say, anti-gravity systems, they don't want us to have that because then we wouldn't buy oil. Therefore, our fake money wouldn't have any value system. Demand uh, would go down. It's all bullshit because you can always figure out a way to, to create a value structure in something. Then anyway, we've got to deal with this full cleanup. We would probably have to hire psychologists, psychiatrists, various therapists to handle, maybe even full-on um, general practitioners to figure out what's going to happen when grandma finds out we didn't go to the moon or grandpa. Some people might just have a goddamn heart attack because, you know, uh, let me give you an extreme example. Two family members, I'm making this up, two family members have disputed it out that the moon missions were real or fake. One, one group believes it was real, one group believes it was fake. As uh, the Aussie man said, one guy says, fuck you, no fuck you, no fuck you. It goes back and forth, and then one of them dies. In fact, the guy that believes it was a hoax dies, and the guy that thinks it was real lives. 
And then NASA comes out 10, 20 years later and says, yeah, by the way, we didn't go to the moon. And then that guy has a, he dies of cardiac arrest, dies of a broken heart, dies of a stroke because he realizes, oh my God, I wasted whatever remaining years I have with this relative. Who wrong a government Prussian education system because it made me feel patriotic. I thought I was supporting my country and I just lost 10 years with perhaps his son, perhaps his brother, perhaps his father. He let it get to that level. Well, there's probably a lot of that. There's going to be a lot of that. I know in my own family, I don't know a single person within my family who thinks the moon missions were fake. Not a one. I also don't know a single one of them that's done a fucking microsecond or a nanosecond of research in it. It's hilarious. But what's going to happen to my parents' world who feels like they have to tow official stories on everything, otherwise, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, fucking truth will consume them or something, right? But that is the huge psychological layer. We're going to have to lean on the greatest minds in our country to figure out scenarios. We're probably going to have to beta test hundreds of people, bringing them inside government buildings and saying, you know, just explaining it to them and saying, look, we need you to sign this non-disclosure. It's only going to last two years or how many years we think we're going to need to clean this mess up, maybe five years just to pretend. Five years or when we tell you otherwise, right? So it's almost like a warranty in a car. You know, it's either uh, every 15,000 miles or one year. But we sit them down and we carefully test the methodologies of explaining it to them. We, we tell them in a one track, we say, how would you feel if you were told that the moon hoaxes were fake? And we watch and we listen and we look at the demographic, demographics, the males, the females, the different ages for every decade, you know, from 10 to 20, 20, 30, 30, 40, etc. The baby boomers, the guys that uh, are still alive that may have been inside World War II, you know. How does this affect them? Those that are religious, those that are atheists, those with technical backgrounds, those with no technical backgrounds, the housewife, the guy that worked his ass off his whole life. Both worked their ass off their whole life, but you know what I'm, talking, you know what I'm saying here. Your school teacher, based on the results of those empirical tests, we have to be able to come up with the best possible strategy, like, like a campaign, like a, excuse me, like a political campaign. Ideally speaking, to go back to the financial bucket for just a split second here, we're dealing with about $21.9 billion a year just going into the NASA organization at $60 million a day. All right. We have to figure out a way to maintain, just for the sake of the health of the economy of the United States of America, all those employees and the same P&L, the same payroll, all that stuff, you have to figure out what percentage is going to be absolutely erased and reapplied someplace else. Now, $22 billion for the United States of America is pitifully squat money. It is truly nothing when it comes to the kind of money that we spend. You, and I want to preface this with saying, we're not going to have any huge financial problems because the President of the United States, whoever that is, could easily sign an executive order that would reallocate another $20 billion. Start a completely different agency. So let's just say we're able to scrap 20 out of the $22 billion into a brand new organization, Space Force, but the president could come in and say, I'm going to double the employees. I'm going to subsidize aerospace education. Kids from, you know, kindergarten up are going to learn physics, trigonometry, geometry, every single thing, Euclidean mathematics, we're going to, everything so that we have tons of brilliant kids to fill these roles. If you think about it, a kid who's uh, 15, 14 to 15 years old, he's, he's going into high school, which is now usually ninth grade here in the United States. If you simply said, hey, are you interested in this program? Well, we'll pay for your college. But the, the stipulation is, is right here inside high school, you're going to have to roll in this track. You're going to have to take physics, all this mathematics, it's, it's astronomy, cosmology, whatever we got access to at that school. And then we'll pay for a four-year to a 10-year to get you your PhD. We could start right away. 
put money into all the institutions that would make this happen for us. But when things happen and change happens, it freaks the crap out of people, which is why I would want this to be as smooth as possible. Now, let's go to the cleanup of all of the claims that were made by NASA from its inception to the day that this occurs. There have been lies after lies after lies. We would need an a independent, believable group of people. And if I were the United States of America government, I would solicit probably people like myself, Jaronism, Mark Sargent, all these people that have uh, some credibility in, with the listeners. You know, again, some of these people are, some of these people, like, again, Sargent has been accused of being a shill because uh, he just seems to have a shit ton of money to do, run around with Flat Earth. I have no opinion on the subject, just so you know. But you know what I'm talking about. YouTubers who aren't these, you know, shilly mythbusters, right? Mythbusters is a complete fucking shilly show. It is there to propagate lies into the minds of people. Neil deGrasse Tyson, shill. He gets paid to lie. Neil, was it uh, Bill Nye, the douchebag guy, the guy who's a fucking civil engineer actor pretending to be a cosmologist, pretending to be a physicist, pretending to be all this crap. It's all written for him, and he regurgitates it. He tells your child that when they look down, they don't know what gender they are. So they can't be trusted. They can't be a part of this organization. They have to be outed. But we need to take people into whatever surviving evidence that we have to explain to them exactly how these frauds took place. With the death of Gus Grissom and his two uh, co counterparts on the tarmac of the Apollo 1, we need to figure out exactly the human beings that determined when he said the week before, this thing's a lemon and it's never going to be, it's never getting to the moon. We need to isolate exactly the people that greenlit his murder. We need to come clean with the cyanide poisoning, the toggle switch that's been replaced the day before, the way he was murdered. We have to come clean. But every single thing inside NASA that was faked has to be exposed. If there is still a set somewhere, which there, there obviously probably isn't, but if there are somehow memorabilia that these people took around, you know, I'm gonna, let me keep that one thing, let me keep this. I doubt that ever occurred because just like Kubrick getting rid of all his stuff in 2001 to make sure people didn't uh, replicate things. And again, a lot of that's been over-exaggerated. There's a Kubrick uh, exhibit that goes around the world. There's a lot of lies where they tell you that, I'll tell you everybody was murdered at a particular location, but God damn, there sure are a lot of survivors. <laughs> Fucking hilarious. So whatever's left, how are we can improve that this occurred? Imagine going from a person that has really had acidic angst from hanging on to the lie, worried about um, being murdered, worried about their kids being murdered, worried about their money being taken away and their kids dying in some ditch, and being able to come out and not only get it off your chest, but to live in the light that is um, the repair process. Hey, Buzz Aldrin. You didn't go to the moon. We know you didn't go to the moon. You admitted it right to Bart Sabrell in the back of the bookstore. If you show this to anybody, I'll sue you. Oh, really? The legitimate evidence that you took pictures of the Earth through a portal window in Apollo 11? If we show that to anybody, you'll sue Bart? Why would you do that? I mean, if someone stole my home fucking videos of me chilling out at a pool, and I didn't show my wiener, yeah, go ahead and fucking show it to the world. I don't fucking care. It's what really happened in the backyard of my uncle's house when I was at his pool. Big deal. But if I was lying and I was, the woman next to me is not my wife or my girlfriend and it's going to expose the fact that I'm a cheater, then I might say, I'll sue you. It's private property, blah, blah, blah. Buzz never went. Now, maybe Buzz is so 10 sheets to the wind with dementia and Alzheimer's. His uh, beta amyloids are uh, all plaqued out in his brain. He doesn't know. But there's plenty of astronauts that do. Plenty of uh, NASA employees that do. Okay. It's going to be a different tone if we do it right. If the, pro if the 
Public Relations Blitz is done correctly. We have a ton of documentaries created by people like us going in there and just busting their balls in a polite way, of course. Because again, the, the odds that we're going to be talking to someone across the table that is actually the, the first degree participant of the moon hoax is pretty, pretty rare. And again, the big misnomer about any hoax is that there are tens of thousands of people involved in the hoax, right? It, I mean, if you're saying, I just can't believe the moon hoax is real because think of that means like 10,000 people would have to be involved or thousands of people have to be, it's like, you're dumb. You're dumb. You're not smart. That is not a fucking intellectual smart question to ask because you don't know jack all about compartmentalization. What were people seeing at these uh, three radio towers uh, supposedly listening to the Apollo 11 mission? They're looking at transmissions coming in. Do you think they have anything to do with the hoax? Why would they? All those people at, at you know Houston Mission Control, what are they doing? They're sitting there looking at monitors, puking out numbers. What do they know? Nothing. There's a few administration people at the top and a bunch of CIA people pulling this crap off. And, of course, the astronauts have to be involved in it, which is why they looked so fucking depressed at their press conference. They had lied to the American people, and they were just sure it was a countdown until they got caught. As all the missions were over and decades passed, they feel absolutely hubris that no one's ever going to find out. But eventually, Mr. Astronaut... You're going to meet God. And that's when you're going to be a fucking horse's ass. So you've got a chance, if you're not dead yet, to clean up your act. And if an astronaut was murdered up in Ojai because he told his buddies he was going to come clean at the 40th anniversary, then guess what? He met his God not a horse's ass. He was murdered because he was going to tell the truth. That's the way to go out, guys. That's the way to go out. And there's no reason why you can't hold a press conference and do a live stream on YouTube, a live stream on Facebook. You can do them at the same time. You could bring 20 cameras, 20 different channels to YouTube and Facebook and broadcast it all over the fucking world and no one can come after you. No one can come after you. You'd be free and clear and you would clean up this entire planet because there's a catch. And we're going to go into this the last part. We're not quite there yet. But there's a catch. Once NASA goes clean, everything gets to go clean. If QAnon is real, his next endeavor would be to come clean. Everything's got to come clean. Again, doesn't mean you don't have black ops projects. It doesn't mean we don't develop technology to protect ourselves or create, again, interrupters for world wars or acts of terror. So what do we have so far? Let's recap. We do a gigantic budgetary analysis of the various compartments of NASA and all related departments, GPL spinoff stuff, SpaceX spinoff stuff, and the thousands of companies that are attached. And we reassign it to a new agency, probably Space Force, but something that's going to have the uh, sort of integrity by design meaning there's so many checks and balances, there's so much transparency that once moved into this organization, you have a bunch of, you know, microscopes and telescopes on you so that we can always see what you're doing. Who you are as an individual then becomes public record. Just like when you become the president of the United States, a ton of information about you becomes public. When your company goes public, everyone's salaries are published to the world. You want to find out what the CEO of Disney makes? Just go look it up. Next up, we have the, the sociological and psychological experimentation to find out how the human mind at this day and age, and let's just say 20, 2020 era, would wake up and handle this epiphany. How are they going to handle it? They're going to be joyous. They're going to be crying in their beer. Will people double down on religion? Will people get rid of religion? Will they distrust their government or trust them more? I mean, I would hope that if someone comes clean, you can trust them more, can't you? Especially if you install checks and balances to make sure that lying is very difficult moving forward. We don't want to lose the momentum of the space program. So we need to develop a technique to double down and maybe triple down and quadruple down on the educational requirements to actually accomplish what NASA was supposed to be doing. Again, Start science education at the second a child can 
look at a picture and speak about it is when you start introducing them to scientific theory. And what we've actually figured out, of course, we think that there's a lot of lies coming out of them about a lot of things. And again, if you're a flat earther, this might be a little painful to listen to because you're like, dude, there's no fucking, you know, planet. There's no planets. There's no this and that and the other thing. Well, hey, if that's the case, then Jesus, uh, even more reason to come clean about everything. The third stage so far is to then debut dozens and dozens and dozens of documentaries where normal human beings like us have a chance to ask every critical question about the projects that have been forged. You know, there was, I want to digress for one second about the Challenger conspiracy. There is this conspiracy out there that the astronauts of the Challenger, they blew up in uh, January 28th, 1986, all survived except for one guy that may have perished just due to old age because he was one of the older guys on the ship. And that they have actually found them all over the United States of America. A lot of them are proxies to NASA. One has his own, supposedly has a company that serves NASA. One is a huge advocate. The woman that was uh, Macaulay, or sorry, Macaulay Culkin, no. Um, The school teacher chick. That she is now a professor that is a NASA advocate. And so there's these photographs of these individuals aged on the web. Supposedly, uh, three of them use the exact same name as the as their previous incarnation. So it's as if the space shuttle never has anyone in it. This thing blew up. Oh my God, these families think their relatives have died, but they haven't died because they're on the ground because the whole thing's a bunch of bullshit. And it, which makes sense. If the space shuttle was fake, uh, you know, then you do just launch this thing into space. No one worries about it exploding because everyone's going to be okay until it explodes. And then you're like, oh my God, how do we do this? Uh, when the space shuttle lands and people get out of it, it's because you put it on the back of a 747, you get it up there, and then you do something to it to make it go quickly so it lands. Now, I've seen the space shuttle take off with Sally Ride. Uh, Christy McAuliffe is the woman's name. And I've seen it land in the desert. I think it was 1988 or 89 when I saw it land in the desert. And I heard the sonic booms. I looked up. The thing was upside down. And it did this crazy horseshoe and then came in and landed there were no jet sounds you know i I don't even remember the escort i don't remember the uh f-16 escort i don't remember that at all and this note was we were out there with 850,000 people but let's just say that that okay so um, the, the challenger hoax might be this that came out and it circled the world. I had just come back from Hawaii where I watched, I looked at the tombstone of the astronaut that died up there that was from Hawaii. But now what have we had debuts since then? We've had this technology debuted that they can make artificial intelligent generated faces. Uh, the big famous one is Barack Obama. They took one of his speeches that he made and used all these photographs of him from different ages and uh, simulated him giving the speech with all of the idiosyncrasies of his face, which sounds super duper complicated. And, you know, it's probably more complicated for the geometry programmers than it is for the actual isolating muscle tissue things. Recently on Facebook, they have encouraged everyone to give a 10 year side by side example of them aging. And all the sheep went out and posted that. What that is, is one, Facebook is called Facebook. It is to put everyone in the world inside of a face face recognition system. Well, the 10-year aging thing is to provide the artificial intelligence computers of the deep state and, and, well, probably just the deep state to figure out how a face ages. Now, imagine that technology existed 20 years ago And the space shuttle survivor conspiracy theory is nothing more than an artificial intelligence taking a photograph from before and aging it. If you're a white guy, the algorithm goes a little faster. If you're an Asian guy, it goes a little slower. If you're a woman, it changes. If you're a man, it changes. And so they generate these fake pictures, put it out there with a nice story about all these people, but no one's walked up and met these people? Really? Where is uh, wearechange.org? I think that guy would go out and find him and say, 
are you really the twin brother of this astronaut? I think I was, uh, in previous episodes, I was a little bit more on the side of believing that conspiracy, and now I feel sort of like a dope. Oh my god, it was just the fucking AI thing. Brilliant. Hook, line, and sinker, man. If these individuals are alive, then we should have students sitting in their class, especially the Christy McAuliffe lady who's supposedly a professor at some university on the East Coast. I don't even care if she's just available. Any one of these people are available. You just, you know, you work with them. Get your camera out on your phone and walk up to them and go, Hey, are you really the twin brother of one of these astronauts from the uh, uh, Challenger? Yeah, and you have the same name. It's like Landfill from fucking Beer Fest. It's hilarious. Mind if you just call me Landfill to keep it clear? It's the most brilliant character swap in any movie I've ever seen. So there has to be credible resources that basically debunk this entire thing. There are a lot of folks that have probably participated in the moon hoax that would love to come out. You know, I don't really want to name any names, but there's some very famous people uh, in special effects that may have participated that are still alive to this day. One of them's initials DT. Maybe. Maybe those individuals participated. Some people are probably going to hang on to the lie simply to make sure that uh, they don't have to ever go back to their family and admit that they lied. So we need a whole separate track of the psychology of this thing to make sure that people who participated in this have a chance. Well, we provide the best accepted story. Not story as in fake, but reasoning why this occurred. You know, sometimes people have anxiety about things and and you just sit down with them and say, well, that, there's no reason to have an anxiety over that. And they'll go, what do you mean? Well, just look at it this way. Ba, 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 ba. And they go, oh, yeah. So now you don't have an anxiety. Go, well, we'll go home and tell that person what you think now. Tell them that you, that you love them, that you believe in them and all this other stuff. And they do it and their life is better. But in their mind, they hadn't taken the thought far enough forward. So if someone has lied to their family for 50 years about them being involved with the conspiracy... It allows them to, to get out with a get out of jail free card, hopefully. And again, if anybody loves you, they're going to work with you. It's just that simple. Even if you're no longer in their world, you've divorced or something like that. In that case, you may not even care. Then there's the spin. Why did America fake the moon landings? Well, as I covered in 165 extensively, and which blows me away, I had a 20. 20 minute monologue prior to actually getting to the substance of sort of the moon evidence 2.0 and 165 and it is almost at 30,000 views at this point it's about 28,000 views which just blows me away I commend people listening to that but we were supposedly and it did occur we are bankrupting Russia by creating this space war which was very abstract from any Cold War objective, any Cuban missile crisis situation, it was extremely costly. What did it cost to put missiles in Cuba? Well, geez, one, they don't have to be real. They're just tubes that you put over there just to threaten them. But, I mean, you had missiles. You had missiles, so big deal. You put them on a boat, you smuggle them over to Cuba, you line them up, you put them outside so that you 2 planes can take pictures of them, you freak out the United States of America, you give a cause to keep a fake war going, and we're probably high-fiving... Khrushchev in the background. Now, the banning of Cuban cigars in America is probably the biggest loss of that whole Cuban Missile Crisis. Or of Castro, you know, using the deep state to take over his country and then flipping the bird. It's pretty funny when you, uh, just to digress for a split second there. So Cuba makes cigars. They make some of the best cigars in the world if you know, well, if you like that sort of thing. If you don't like necessarily completely bold tastes all the time. And we provide, I mean, if we were to turn on Cuban um, exports for cigars, and you can bring back about $800 worth of cigars now on a single trip. So we do have that ability today. So if people get legal uh, Cuban cigars all the time now. But, you know, all of Europe has bought Cuban cigars forever. China buys Cuban cigars. The, uh, it just, we're nothing to their, well, we're not nothing, but we're definitely, they're not hurting they can't keep up with world demand as it exists today. So this, this embargo against their tobacco is just bad math. It's really sad. I think the most logical spin to tell the rest of the world 
And one we would have, I, I really don't know how to discuss the issue of dealing with Russia and their stop animation forgeries of being in low orbit. I don't know how proud they are about it. Uh, of course, they hold a lot of the records, Sputnik and you know the first animal in space, first man in space, for, for first double mission in space, first woman in space, first spacewalks, you know. I believe they have the spacewalk uh, record as well, but whatever. I don't know how proud they are. I think they're very proud people. They are just getting on their feet in a really amazing way over there. I mean, Moscow is is like Rodeo Drive, except it's the size of a gigantic city. It's literally a little Dubai with a bad winter. But sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. You come clean and other people don't come clean. So what? But we say, look, we take the tack of this. They say, look, uh, the Cold War had gone on for too long. People were worried about a nuclear holocaust. And that needed to end. And so America did whatever it needed to do to make it end. And quite technically, historically, 1972 ends the Apollo 17 mission. Vietnam War goes about two and a half more years. It's over. And then by 1976, we have the beginning of one of the golden eras of the United States of America. Between 1976 and the invasion of Kuwait slash Iraq, America was, in, in just my own analysis of looking back, now that we know that the Roaring Twenties weren't were the Roaring Twenties, it looks like after World War II, you have this baby boomer era, but it was shorter lived because of the Korean War slash police maneuver, right? It was a war, but we didn't want to call it that because that requires a lot of congressional oversight. We were inside the duck and cover era. People were worried about the nuclear holocaust back then. So between 76 and about 1990, the United States of America, I can't speak for other countries, we were in an unbelievably positive realm. And even after that, with the deep state trying to push, you know, Bart Simpson, be a loser, that's cool, uh, grunge music, which was, you know, go to fucking thrift stores and buy all your clothes so that the people that actually need to buy thrift clothes have to buy the worst options because the rich kids came in and bought them and patted themselves on the back. I still, kids are still doing this to this day. You know, it's like, I guess it's a free market, but if, if I were to run one of these organizations, it would be, you need some sort of a, uh, you know, EBT card, like the welfare card or something to come in and even shop in this place because you're destitute. You're a homeless person. Yeah, let's get you a suit so you can go get a job. Instead, the fucking rich kid comes in and buys all that clothing. And I know some fucking totally rich kids, rich, intellectual, 180 IQ kids that go in and they still can't figure out what they're doing. But the internet blew up. HTTP protocols dropped on the world in the early 90s. And so the internet took us through the 90s up until that day in September 11th. So the spin might be, look, this was a way to end this Cold War. You know, they, and they technically give the Cold War a lifespan way into the Reagan era. I wasn't worried about the Russians my entire childhood uh, and my teens, which would be the mid to late 70s all the way through the 90s. Uh, there, Nobody gave a shit about that. No one's sitting in America going, oh my God, I hope I don't get killed by an... You know, an atomic bomb. Even with the movie War Games with Matthew Broderick, no one worried. It was fun. It was a game. You know, it was all over. Obviously, we would need to go to a think tank or create a think tank where everyone participating in this coming clean strategy, all the most brilliant minds in the United States of America would have to go into some sort of resort, warehouse, business, building complex, and we would need to simulate this over and over and over again. Hiring groups to pretend to be the public, playing devil's advocate to everything that we're trying to do to quash them, and they're going to have to simulate resistance. We're going to have to have someone fake, within the think tank, fake headline news. Both the broadcast headline news, internet headline news, newspapers, magazines, everything. 
we're going to have to role play forward all of the implications that might happen for movies, for television shows, as they integrate the script into their scripts. You know, the coming clean script. I hate to say script because it sounds fictional. A script does not have to be fictional. But what's going to happen? There's going to be comedians that go into nightclubs and they're going to run jokes, which is going to be a very healthy byproduct of this admission. Because everyone's going to need to laugh as quickly as possible. But here's another thing that we have to make sure that we would manifest in this, I believe, just riffing, okay? There needs to be a demarcation line between the past methods and the present methods. The public has to be able to believe a thousand percent, and we have to do whatever we can to make this the case. And if the Great Awakening is real, and Q is real, and Donald Trump's Q relationship is real, and we're getting rid of all the pedophiles and deep staters and 5 I organizations, that must take place. And if they are smart, they would grease the skids on this, because it will help their efforts considerably. But we have to prove to the uh, our local population of the United States of America and the rest of the world that beyond this point of coming true, it's no longer going to be possible to lie like this because there'll be checks and balances installed in these locations. And we have to be cynical about those checks and balances for the remainder of our existence. You know, you have a guy watch a guy and a girl watches the guy and a girl watches that girl. You know, it's like, it's like, it's, um, it's one of these things where no one can be trusted. So we constantly have to check each other. There are experts out there that can do this. They can create systems where no one can lie. But we say, look, those, those methods of managing a giant population are over. They were naive. They were deceptive. They were sinful. We don't do that anymore. Do we have secret black op projects? Yes. What kind are they? Are they in this division, that division, that division? Our enemy knows, so why the hell not tell the public? Yes, we have aviation black op projects. What is, the, what is the goal of that? To create high-speed supersonic aircraft to be able to fly around the world in split seconds to be able to survey that our enemies slash partners in the world, I hate to say enemies, okay, maybe I should redact that, that our partners on planet Earth are doing exactly as they say. They're not building underground, you know, systems to develop horrible weapons they're not amassing troops on the borders blah 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 let's just all get along god damn go figure that's such a revolutionary idea i would be interested at the end of a think tank experiment to see how long we think the residual effects of coming clean would take how long is it going to take for a baby boomer to accept that it didn't happen. I mean, Bart Sabrell talked about a professor that he interviewed, and he said, what if Buzz Aldrin came out and said it was all fake? And he said, I would still believe it because I saw it on TV, and I would think Buzz has simply gone into a state of dementia, Alzheimer's, and he's lying. That is the way the mind works. A cowardice mind will do that. It can't accept that we didn't go. So it hangs on and hangs on. What's interesting, we recently had a listener come through that was lecturing me about the fact that we did go and that I just need to watch a few cognitive science videos and uh, sort of basic psychology videos to figure out how I'm a denier that we did go. He is obviously not dealing with any of the issues. He won't, he won't take on any of the specific smoking guns. He won't even remotely attempt to take on the actual issues. But for him, he retreated like a coward into these other uh, mechanisms to say, well, that person must be broken because of this. And it's so easy for me to believe everything that, they are, that I'm told, and I'm going to go to my grave a sucker. And as soon as there's truth after death, you realize you wasted your life. And if you ever convince anybody that we went who was previously skeptical, you will find out that you did harm to your fellow man. You broke common law because you were a coward. Now, let's go to the next gear. Why wouldn't they do this? I mean, I think I've made a pretty basic case for this. Why wouldn't they do this? See, I have, for some 
reason I have a mysterious uh, connection with Donald Trump. I'm able to sit down with him in private and I pitch this whole thing to him or <laughs> he's messing around on YouTube in the middle of the night and he finds this video and he's like, oh, that's cool. Let's watch this. Boom. Seems like he watched my other video about creating a space agency on the side. But he gets to this and he's like, hmm, that, that does sound pretty good. And it probably would help my movement. And I wouldn't be fighting this whole QAnon movement all by myself. Well, once the government admits that it has clandestine projects that then go public as a, an official story moon mission lie. And again, Gus Grissom. Gus Grissom was murdered with his two counterparts. That's big news, man. And you better believe they are just three of the folks that we know were murdered. There had to have been more. Just like the JFK witnesses. Murdered because they knew more. Happens all the time. Seth Rich, anybody? It creates what we call a cascade, doesn't it? It becomes this fast replicating virus of truth. And then everything has to come out now, doesn't it? So you would have to have a bunch of military individuals that have a clean background. I mean, you don't actually have to have that if they're willing to repent and come clean. As long as you're not the guy that wrote the plan to create these false flags, then you're probably okay. There's a method for you to get out free and clear without being, you know, lynched by a bunch of people. What most people don't live in, you know, there's, there's very few humans on earth that live inside this bubble. But to illustrate this very specifically, you and I live in a world where we don't have death threats. Death threats are extremely powerful for some people. One, they're, they're free to do. Call someone up, leave a voicemail. Uh, best, you know, you put a thug on somebody's property and they, they manhandle you a little bit. And depending on how you interpret that, you could shit yourself literally and then, you know, you're, you're putty in their hands. They kidnap your kid. Okay. That's control. Now, if that were to occur, then you have this mysterious force out there of which you have no orientation to. Who is doing this? Well, people way more powerful than me because they're willing to separate themselves from money to put this person on my doorstep, to put this person calling me. You know, Stanley Kubrick pulled uh, Clockwork Orange out of viewership in England because he got death threats. This is a public, a matter of public record. Someone really hated that movie, and so he wasn't going to play any games. So it could air everywhere else, but not in England. So when it comes to individuals being hesitant about, about coming clean, who knows what they've been told and who knows what their constitution is. It could be a very strong-minded man or woman in military, in the sciences, in the politics. And recently they haven't had any, in fact, they may have never had a true death threat. Someone who calls up and says, now you're on my list. And it's just a matter of time before you're taken out. But maybe, way back at the inception and involvement in this project, they had the very meticulously detailed consequences outlined to them. Michael Rupert claims that he was brought to Washington D.C. and recruited by an alphabet agency to handle the drug trafficking of that alphabet agency here in the Los Angeles area. He declined. His parents were uh, in intelligence. He was just going to become a, a police officer here in Los Angeles. I think eventually he got into narcotics, I think. And uh, eventually he just saw the damage of that importation of drugs into the ghettos to destroy societies and the violence that it caused, all the drive-by shootings and gang-on-gang -gang violence, and finally he blew the whistle. Rest in peace. He eventually killed himself about four years ago, four or five years ago. So people may be still hanging on to a previous experience, a previous commitment to keep their mouth shut. The government itself would have to put resources behind these individuals to ensure that those threats never became true. To prove to them, we'll first investigate who would maintain such a contract on someone, absolve them and give them immunity. For those that are still hanging on to the deep state agencies that might retaliate against anyone who is true, we have to take our military, our, our four-star generals, and assign them to finding these individuals and eliminating them, putting them in jail, 
For those that can't be put in jail, we have to reverse the algorithm on them. Sit them down and say, okay, you're part of this cabal that threatens individuals for telling the truth. Well, this truth is coming out. You're now on our list. We're going to know where you are at all times in history. We will be listening to all your phone calls, all your communications. If you try to leave behind a device, we will still hear you. So you're now on the list. Do you understand? Do you have any questions? Good. You're obsolete, man. By the way, that's the name of the episode in Charlie's Zone. It's called Obsolete Man. I got that wrong on the episode I just released. I said obsolete. I don't know why I could think of Burgess Meredith's uh, episode. We have to make sure that people who have the information that we need feel safe. But the cascade is going to spread into other areas, right? Now, what's awesome about this concept is that if we could ever pull off the true disclosure of the moon missions and all the other fake space research, we might find out a couple of interesting things. One, some of this is real. We do have a space station, let's just say. We have been to Europa, the moon of Jupiter. We did put a, uh, a satellite on the Titan moon of Saturn. How exciting would that be? If we really were able to say, yeah, we legitimately do that. And these people could go in front of press conference and say, yeah, we really do do that. We don't have any rovers on Mars, uh, but maybe we have one reconnaissance satellite on Mars, you know, circling Mars. But we haven't been able to release the data because we faked the surface of the, mo uh, surface of, of the planet Mars. But here's the real information. How exciting would that be? And then all these people have been trying to tell the truth forever can now have their day in the light their 15 hours of fame but we have other moments right we have moments prior to the moon missions we have all the assassinations of the 60s it is time to come clear come clean excuse me it's time to come clean who killed jfk here's what i didn't know according to a video i watched that broke down the actual report that was recently declassified about the jfk assassinations they're now saying that the first shot that went through Kennedy's throat was from the, the bridge, which had the railroad tracks on it. Well, there you go. You can't have your official story. J or uh, Lee Harvey Oswald is not the dude. Big surprise. I mean, again, who is crapping themselves that matters in the world anymore? So some 80-year-old guy or 70-year-old guy is like, oh, God, it's not, you know, Lee Harvey Oswald. I've been wrong my whole life. Okay, well, then, you know, toughen up there, snowflake. But it doesn't matter. What matters is our kids get to hear the truth. And it's, a, it's an era past. It was an intelligence agency that got completely out of fucking control. But what other things would cascade? The reasons why we start wars would probably cascade down. Hmm. Well, we're in a process right now where our president is pulling us out of as many war theaters as possible. Yes, there are secret missions going on in Somalia and a bunch of other things going on. All these planes falling out of the sky suddenly and training exercises. The inside word is that supposedly the previous president gave away our security communications codes. And so foreign agencies are actually able to control our planes, drill through and find out where people are at any one point in time. A Chinese company created a bunch of cell phones that were listening to soldiers in the fields. And so they were able to find out where all of our forces were and that were and sell that information to people that could hurt them. It's, it's, a, it's a war out there, you know, it's always going on. But when you keep everything secret, then no one can help you. How many sitcoms? I've told you this guy, this in season one, half a dozen times. What's the format of a 25 minute sitcom? A character in the sitcom does something feels scared, hides it. They hide it for 10 minutes. It takes, well, it takes five minutes to uh, create the, I broke the vase. I mean, there was a, there was a Fresh Prince of Bel-Air where I think uh, someone broke a vase or broke a light or some shit and then they glued it back together or they hid it and then they lied about it. And then for 10 minutes, it's the stress of the lie with a nice subplot that's not related to the lamp breaking. And the moral of the story in the last five minutes is that they reveal the fact they broke the lamp and it's one of these things of, why didn't you just tell me it's okay, we would just replace it, accidents happen. That's the average archetype of a sitcom. Okay. So we have a bunch of people who have lied. Okay. We're okay. We're grown-ups now. We're so much more grown-up. 
We have been in the middle of a terrorist war for now almost 20 years based on a crappy event that was also orchestrated by these deep staters, by this, these alphabet agencies, by the tiny smidgen within those alphabet agencies. We have a human trafficking situation. It's all around the world. I mean, can you believe at this point in 2019, we are fighting to get Jeffrey Epstein's court hearing, a public videotaped court hearing, so we can hear the charges, so we can hear the evidence? And you have the Democrats sitting there, the Democrats, they're sitting there trying to hide all that stuff because that's, that's their game. That's what they do. So what else would come out? What else would come out? Yeah, military? Okay, so we know that, uh, again, the military is, is in large part, from what I understand, fairly immune at times in conspiracies where people are selling you know, M16s to drug cartels and they get bags of coke in return. They bring it back to the ghetto and they sell it at like a thousand to ten thousand percent profit. All right. It's the uh, Fast and Furious project down there. People inherited that. Holder was one of the guys under Obama that inherited that program. And we might be able to give that guy a pass, but then he walked around against, you know, giving speeches against the Constitution. He was even throwing his own people under the bus, saying the blacks are like animals and all this other stuff. Weird, man. But that particular day in 2001, it stinks to high heaven, doesn't it? We have neocon organizations that help instigate that and plan it. We have Zygmunt Brzezinski, who's thankfully no longer with us, who helped design it. Those would most likely be the next targets. There are probably things going on in this world that we have nothing to do, nothing, no knowledge of, right? Let's just say Roswell is a true event, which seems almost hard to, hard to say publicly. And they did recover a little, you know, ET guy. Let's say they kept him alive for a little while. I mean, there's all kinds of news about that. We're we're now learning that Hitler went to Argentina. At this point, he went to Argentina. We got photographs of him down there. They've done documentaries down in Argentina, talking to everyone who took care of him back in the day. He really went there. Sorry for all of you who want to believe he bet a Sinai capsule and was burned up in his cot in some bunker. The visual evidence of that body is absolutely non-conclusive. He was burned beyond recognition. Whoever that body was. Was it Ava was his, his uh, girlfriend. They went down there, got married, had a kid who might be Angela Merkel. Who knows? He dies in uh, the early 60s. His wife dies in the late 60s. They lived a full life. We're figuring that out. A tremendous amount of history that is used to manipulate the world's sympathies into giving away things for free are now being revised. The... I mean, there have been, I'll just be as abstract as possible, but there are plaques that were on monuments claiming history went one way that have been silently pulled down, redone, and replaced so that, such that the facts are no longer what they were, but people still regurgitate the facts as it was when the plaque was originally put on there. Scientific analyses of claims no longer pan out. Other stuff would cascade out, but guess, guess what? Once you figure out a method to tell the truth, and, and let's say we grease this machine, everything I talked about, p &L statements being repurposed, the psychological analysis of how humans would respond to the truth, the PR blitz, the spins, all this stuff. Once you get good at it, you can do it over and over and over again. Now, some things just simply happen on this planet that are absolutely evil, done by evil people. You know, there are people that do get upset and walk in and kill a bunch of people. It happens. I realize that. But then there are events that uh, uh, are, you know, false flags used to be nobody got killed. And now false flags are bloodbaths. They figure out a way to, to, to really create horrible loss and then try to manipulate things. I don't know about you, but I want to live in a world where we can tell the truth to each other. It's important as a human being to be able to do that. Once you start living in a fantasy land, well then, geez, how can you keep track of your life? You can't. 
You can't rely on anything. People can manipulate your country into horrible forms of your company. Country, excuse me. Socialism, which is, again, a polished version of communism. It's never worked anywhere in the world, ever, ever, ever. Countries are going bankrupt with their universal health care. We have health, uh, health crises going on in this world that needs to be exposed. You know, Alzheimer's. My God, I've been doing more research on this recently, and it, you know, the guy existed in like 1906 when he found it, Mr. Alzheimer's. And it was fairly rare back in the day. And it was fairly rare because we didn't have obesity. You know, now we have this whole movement to plus size models and all that kind of stuff. Now, there are people who are big, and they're always going to be big. They're big boned, and they just have that, uh, that, that configuration of the human body, and that's that can be a very beautiful thing. But we have kids that are, have no such predisposition genetically that are now like, I can be super fat, and it's and if I any anyone says, hey man, you know, you sure you're okay with all that? You don't fat shame me. All right, well, universal health care should require that an individual remain healthy, because we're all sporting the bill of this thing. Which is why you don't want that. We have so much sugar in the diet of mankind that our, you know, everyone's in some form of insulin shock. Insulin carries your sugar into your cells. Your glucose. You eat too much of that crap, there, there can't be enough insulin created to carry it into your cells. And so then you get insulin shock. It's all floating around your body. But we can't be honest with anything, right? We have agencies, well, we have complete divisions of medicine that are complete bullshit. We have draconian techniques of trying to cure cancer with, <laughs> with science that hasn't been updated in a patent form since 1989, which was a minor update, which is, you know, chemotherapy. But you have courts in various uh, states in the United States of America that if you don't put your kid through chemotherapy, which will kill your child or your spouse, they will, I mean, absolute fucking Orwellian deep state draconian manner force your family member to ingest a toxic chemical, which is known for killing its patients. Huge 90 plus percentile rate of killing its patients instead of trying vitamin C and B17 Cutting out sugars and meats. Getting cured. You know, again, there's all kinds of techniques. The Gershom technique. It's amazing how brilliant we were in the first decade of the 20th century. Between 1900 and 1910. We, we really had it figured out. And because we figured out how to cure it, evil people figured out how to cause it. I think NASA can come clean. NASA's never going to come clean by themselves. They're going to need to force to become clean because they're absolutely terrified of what will happen to their spoils as a result of coming clean. Hopefully, this little exercise in thought presents several plausible possibilities to actually execute a full disclosure moment. I can only speak from being a citizen of the United States of America. One of the reasons why I love it when you guys comment from your individual countries, and I'm telling you, I just want to make a very big point here. Every time I read a comment where someone says, I'm in the UK, I'm in Germany, I'm in Finland, I'm in Australia, and then you give an update, like a very intelligent update. I've never read one that wasn't intelligent uh, so far. But you say, here we have these problems, and they're kind of like your problems. We have other problems, and maybe we got this working really well, but you don't, we do, and but it's still kind of fragile or whatever. Those comments are just weighted in platinum. It's for me, it is a great way for us to be the news, to combine information. As you enlighten me, at times I can bring that information out. From the United States of America, we are currently one of the richest countries in the world. We have trillions of dollars that are collected every single year in taxes. And if we could simply get on a track of telling the truth, Americans should never have to pay for college, but the college organizations have to be completely redone. They do. Now, it's a private industry out there to educate individuals, but if we simply put some mandates down to say, look, like I've said in the past, your degree has to be connected to a 
actual job. If your degree does not attach to a job, you must be completely explicit with those that are buying that degree because you buy the degree. And they say, look, you're going to get us, you're, if you're going to go for your PhD in Chicano studies, there's no job. There's no job. Hey, knock yourself out. It's a free world, but you better be a rich kid. You better be married to someone who can carry you your whole life because you'll never be an earner. Someone who goes into broadcasting or um, medicine or chemistry or whatever, those are meat and potato jobs. You can get a job once you get those degrees. If nothing else, you can become a teacher, but you're teaching a trade skill. A kid who learns chemistry or something is going to be able to become something of all kinds of different proportions. You can, you can manufacture things and know how plastics you know, mutate during the process of being created. You could do all kinds of stuff. Maybe invent something brand new that replaces something that we should get rid of. The money that we create needs to be spent for the overall goal of a particular country. If Let's say that nuclear power is still creating a bunch of really toxic water and a bunch of, you know, uh, uranium rods or what have you, you know, some sort of toxic uh, byproduct that we have to bury in the ground for, you know, nine and a half million years before it starts to starts to become less radioactive, then we need other forms of energy. There's this huge debate about the 5G cell phone networks, the fifth generation of all those cell phone networks. It's going to toxify the world on a level that's crazy. Now, they're supposedly, you know, going to release uh, cures to cancer here to counteract the cell phone liability that's out there. And again, for those that have created videos debunking 5G networks, you need to go and watch all the town hall meetings where scientists come in from both the medical industry and the technical industry saying, look, we have case studies and clinical studies proving that this type of agitation of the human body through tight frequencies does cause cancer and a bunch of other horrible things. Diabetes is one of the byproducts of electromagnetism on the human body. It interferes with the production of insulin from your pancreas. It's bad news. And for all the scientists that, that pride themselves on being evolutionists, okay, well, I can use it against you. Man went millions and millions of years as homo sapiens sapien without any of this bombardment of home networks, of wireless transmissions, of high tower, uh, high tension tower lines, toxic GMO foods, of microwaves that pulver pulverize food compounds into food elements that are toxic. You know, again, draconian chemotherapy. Let's make chemotherapy completely obsolete. Let's put oncologists completely out of business. Can you imagine going to some uh, medical conference and you've got, uh, let's say, 5,000 oncologists coming in to get sort of a, an update and you walk up to the podium and you say, we're going to cure cancer. This is the cure. Everyone's going to take it. It's not going to exist. You're all out of business. What do you think would happen instantaneously? They're going to go back to their little breakout points and strategize how to stop the cure of cancer. They're going to strategize on creating new forms of cancer that can't be cured by the cure of cancer because that's their job. Pharmaceutical companies that make tons of treatments for cancer are going to put their billions and billions of dollars behind the conspiracy to keep cancer alive. That's what living in a world of lies turns into, which is why, personally me, I want to live in a world of truth. There are still plenty of infinite mysteries in life. You know, we haven't cured the common cold. We haven't cured the anomalies of love. You know, we, there's plenty of things. The, the, everything is great, but you don't know who you are. You don't know what you want to do. Maybe you did everything you fantasized about doing in your life, and now you've got time on your hands. You're trying to find out how to get through your midlife crisis. We have plenty of mysteries in this world. God forbid we turn into a society where we live in sort of the, the, Greek, the, the golden era of the Greek theater where we enjoy creating beautiful stories that help us educate each other through parables hidden inside of plays. You know, I, I'm going to cite something because it comes to mind right now. I told the story once, a long, long time ago. I, I had made a friend with a girl who was my, a dental hygienist. And her and I just became friends. 
hung out a little bit afterwards with her friends and I even hung out with her fiance at the time. They're now married with children. And I finally met her husband at a restaurant. And I just shook hands, talked to the guy. And then she told me later on that her husband said, man, that guy is really a nice guy. I mean, he really is genuine. He was amazed that he met someone who was genuine and nice, honest. All right. Why? It, let's just say that's true. Let's say I'm a nice guy. Why is that the case? Well, by the time my mind started becoming cognitive reality, whereby I could remember most of the years of my existence, I was about six or seven years old. Well, that's right when America went into the late 70s, the second half of the 70s. I got my formative years in the, in the 80s. And even though it wasn't a full cakewalk, whatever, I can tell you right now, the things that I experienced living in tough neighborhoods where, you know, it was like you had to fight your way home, that kind of shit. In the end, it made me a better person. I got to see this, and I never adopted the lunacy that was around me if I happened to get into it. But when I finally got back to my little hometown in Kansas, again, tiny town with 10,000 people, you don't have the ability to be a jerk unless you want to be completely ostracized from that society. And I can't name more than a handful of people that ever accomplished that. You got along, you behaved because your parents would be told what happened, your grandparents would be told, and because you want the love from them, you behave. And again, whatever you feed grows. So if you feed your devious side, you become a devious bastard. A Zygmunt Brzezinski kind of guy. So by the time I moved to California, I had had a training wheel program and a methodology from some Norman Rockwell town that I grew up in that kept me straight. Then I moved to Southern California right here, but I moved in the northern part in Ventura County, the company I work for. You know, we did TurboTax back in 87. It was called Macintax back in the day. The people that I worked for were exactly like me. Ventura County is uh, almost, well, I would say Ventura specifically, but I worked in Camarillo. So between Camarillo and Ventura, which is about three towns with Oxnard in the middle, People were good to each other. Oxnard was a big Latin-based uh, town. And I would, I would walk to lunch every once in a while. You know, I had to drive to the center of the town. But I'd walk around every once in a while because they'd have these Mexican festivals. And, you know, the, the, you could learn a million things from just the Mexican culture and how they had all, these, all those wild slammed uh, cars that do the three-wheel and stuff that, you know, Snoop Dogg drove around with and Warren G and all those guys. They're made in Oxnard. It's one of the biggest places on earth they make those. And they're just the most beautiful people on planet earth. And you get inside their family circles and you're like, wow, this is, this is the same as my hometown. It's just, they're all from Mexico, but they've been here for a hundred plus years. And so this is their territory and they welcome you in there and they'll check you out a little bit, but they, there was no gang violence in there, any of that shit. It was great. And so I got this nice incubation. I got to continue for almost four more years in Southern California with this truth. It was just a part of us. We helped each other out. You needed something. Someone took their shirt off their back and said, here, you look cold. And you're like, well, you look cold too. And it's like, that's okay. You look sick and cold. <laughs> you know. So they give it to you and you're good. We want truth. We want that beautiful frequency because think about how much... The human mind gets constrained by living in lies. And once again, you feed the ability to lie, to exist. You, you lie all the time because it becomes a technique that you know no better technique to do it. Or you think that um, truth is for suckers. What a sad epitaph if that's true. The Great Awakening is about trying to find as much truth as possible. This episode's about getting one of the stains in American history exposed, cleaned up, and then building literally what you might call a human platform for our country to operate on, and then it's infectious. What if we came clean about the NASA hoax? Would Russia have the ability to do their thing? I mean, Vladimir Putin is not remotely responsible for any of the crap that they did in the 60s and 70s. All right. They at least had the wherewithal in 73 to say, we, we have boosters way more powerful than yours, and we can't escape Earth's orbit. So hats off to the Russians. I have a lot of respect for that. But what other things? What other wars were, were orchestrated? You know, we now know that the opium wars of China 
were completely forced on them because of this profiteering by the UK. Not the citizens of the UK today. Everyone in the, everyone in the UK today, minus maybe a few politicians, they don't engage in opium trade now. They're just normal human beings that want a beautiful world for themselves. The worshiping of the king and queen, well, that is naive, but that is not, the intent is genuine. They want to believe that they're these King Arthur descendants out there and that they're special human beings, etc., etc. So they hang on to that fairy tale. You know, maybe, in an extreme case, organized religion gets deorganized. We no longer have these pedophile agencies that get a blank check constantly. Oh, you're raping and, and, and destroying the minds of children constantly. Well, you just, you're the church, so you're okay with that. You know, we're okay with you being okay with that. You got an excuse? Oh, well, then it's no, no big deal. I think you feel me. It's a beautiful day. It's amazing. Hopefully this episode reflects the, uh, the warmth that I feel here. It's pretty great. Anyway, if you haven't been to deepthoughtsradio.com, please go. That's where we offer two different feeds, video and audio. For those of you who want to get into the discussion, we have a locked Facebook group. For those of you who like Twitter for your notifications, there's a Twitter account. Actually, I just remembered I need to post a couple of notifications there. I don't think a lot of people really want to view it at a location that doesn't actually have the medium um, capable of being viewed within the platform itself. For those who want to tip and donate, you want to buy me a cigar indirectly, we have a Patreon page. The channel's doing well. It's growing for those of you who have ideas for episodes, you can comment in the YouTube channel and the Facebook page. Just understand that if you really, really, really want your episode to be covered and you have like five hours worth of video that you want me to watch, you probably should watch the five hours of video, paraphrase it to me so I can get in quicker and get the information. Just imagine you're my producer at a television show or a radio show. I'm walking in every single day doing three hours or whatever it is. I don't have time necessarily to watch everyone's ideas, but what a, what a producer will do is do the research, find it out, and say, these are, the, these are the points, and you need to put your own spin on this, of course, because it's your show, whatever. It's not my show, that sort of thing, because you don't want to be liable for my opinions. That's what I'm really trying to say here. But pre-produce it as best you can, and I will do my best to get to it. We're moving along. I probably have about four videos that haven't been released. Um, so thank you for joining. Take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you in the next summer day. Over and out.